Well, I'm excited today. There's such a spirit of revival that God is bringing into this house. And I not only here, but I know it's happening in other regions of our country, other churches. And uh, I really wanted to uh, lean into it today. And I want to talk about make room for revival. Make room for revival. Turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I know we all like the word revival. Most people like the word revival. And we like that it's something that we can receive, something that we can enjoy, something we can be a part of. But there is a people, in order to have revival, there has to be a people that's willing to make room for it. There's a people that are willing to put the time in that is going to pray for it, that's going to hunger for it. And I believe God's laid that on this house. I see more and more people coming into this house. God's drawing in people left and right. New people are coming every single week into this house. I don't believe it's an accident. I believe there's a spirit of revival that's at work. And that's why people are coming. They're hungry. And in Mark chapter 1 and verse 32 through 37... It says that at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because he knew them, and they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. There he prayed, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Let's stop there. I want to talk about making room for revival, and I want to give you some things you can write down. The first thing I want you to write down is we must make room physically for revival. We must make room physically I read this passage, and there's a couple of things that jump out at me in this passage. There's a number of things that jump out at me in this passage. And it says that everyone was looking for Jesus. I think there's a lot of people searching. They just don't know it's Jesus they're searching for. But they know when they find a certain place that something is different. When Jesus is in the room, something's different. I don't believe people are looking for church. I don't believe people are looking for religion. I don't believe they're looking for just other believers or even pastors. I believe they're looking for the presence of God. And the presence of Jesus is what they were looking for. And notice what it says in verse 32 and 33. It says, They brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Think about that for a second. And the whole city was standing at the door. Just think if the whole city of Rochester was standing at that door. What would that feel like? And it wasn't a city of five or ten people. Just think if hundreds or thousands were standing at the door. Are we ready for revival? Are we ready for the city to be standing at the door? Are we ready for people to come in to this place, come into this church? Are we physically ready as a building, as a facility? And I'm going to take a a bunny trail here and just allow me to go down this bunny trail um, just for a second because I want to explain to you some things we're doing to get ready. I've been feeling for the last 10, 12 months, whatever it is, God's really doing something in this place that's just different. Something shifted in here last year. And I don't know what it was other than say it was the Spirit of God. And there's a weightier presence of God in this place. And I want to talk about it today more. But as I'm seeing the shift, I realize there's some things that we've got to do physically in this place that I want to share with you this morning because you're a part of it. And then I want to get into other things. But just for a second, I want to go off to this physical side 
because we have been, over the last few years, physically changing this building around. We've been physically changing the cafe. We've changed the bathrooms. I know you're happy about that. <laughs> I know we've changed the nursery. We've changed the school rooms. We've changed the roofs. We've changed a lot of things. We spent 20000 here, 50000 there, 70000 there. And God's always provided. I'm happy to say we have no debt. We've paid everything off. That being said, those things in my mind, though they're 50 and 70,000, are small. Now God's asking us to do bigger things that are 500 and a thousand and a million dollars that I'm, I'm willing to do in making room for revival. When I think of souls, I want people to come in and have a seat to sit in. I want them to have a parking lot to park in that is not full of potholes that you can actually find a line somewhere on the ground. And rather than guessing, I think there was a line here three years ago. And so we are changing some things physically to this place. Starting in the next couple of weeks, you're going to start seeing some transformations in the parking lot. We are putting in a brand new parking lot that's going to be over a million dollars. I know for a million dollars you say, shouldn't it be gold? Because that was my question. This should, shouldn't we be on streets of gold at this point for a million dollars? But we want to do it right, put in new lighting, put in new, new parking lot, get it looking nice. And you'll see some pictures up on the screens of some of the drawings. In the next couple of weeks, you're going to start seeing it. In fact, I'm going to encourage you as you start seeing the... the the parking lot tore up. Probably in July, you'll really start to see it tore up. Um, please do not wear heels, ladies or gentlemen. Please don't wear heels. <laughs> gentlemen, just don't wear heels anyways. That's another whole prayer we got to make. But please, you know, be conscious because we're going to be tearing up and we're going to be laying a whole new parking lot down, a brand new um, drainage and all those things, cleaning up the sides of it. And we're making room. And we really want to make room for the next generation. We really want to make I'm watching people come in. I'm watching God do something. And we need to make room. We also want to make room in our sanctuary. And we've started some drawings. We're not done. So you may see some pictures up there. Please don't think we're even close. But we're starting. That's just an image to go. We're going to start making room in our sanctuary. We're going to change out our pews. We're going to change out our carpet. I know you all love the blue and yellow. But... Uh, we're going to start making changes. Don't worry about the colors there, but we're going to start to make changes in our sanctuary. We're going to start making some changes in our site because we, we know we have to make room. And so we know these are bigger lifts. These are heavier lifts for us. But I know that God's already speaking to this house to make room for revival. And God's speaking to you, and he's speaking to me. And I'm watching people bring people in. I'm watching people invite friends and family into this house. People that don't even know the Lord are starting to come in and ask questions about the church and ask questions, more importantly, about Jesus. Because Jesus, he can heal Linnell. He can give Cheryl a new roof. He can heal any sickness, any disease. He's more than capable. We don't serve a poor God. And so we can make room, and I'm, I'm talking about making room for what God is doing. I see people coming in, not only to our church, to many other churches as well. Some people get all lost in this one single church. It's not. There's a move of God that's taking place all over the world, all over the country. And a lot of churches have heard the word of God that revival is starting in their church. We've heard that word. I'm going to play for you at the end of service this morning some words that have been spoken over this house of God is speaking revival now into this church. But as you think about physically, the whole city being gathered together, everyone is looking for Jesus. We have to make changes because we are believing God for souls. Souls, it's all about souls. It's all about Jesus. I could care less about another building. I could care less about any of that other stuff. I just want to do what God wants us to do. And if he wants us to make some changes for, for souls, I'm happy to do it. Second point, we must make room financially for revival. Financially, you've got to think different. 
When I think about the parking lot, a million dollars. I think about the sanctuary, it'll be a couple million. When I think about all the things that you have to make time for, you have to make provision for, you have to start thinking differently. I know when we started having children, our first house was real tiny. Our first house had one bedroom, and for three years, uh, for our, we lived in that house about 11 years, 10, 11 years. And our son was born, and uh, when he got, and he slept in our bedroom for the first three years. How many would like your child to be in your bedroom for the first three years? <laughs> like all the time in your bedroom. <laughs> and you're a young married couple. <laughs> just let that sink in for just a second. Good times. But that's the reality of where we live. That's the house we had. And when my wife got pregnant with Casey, we're like, we have to have a different house. We have to make room. I don't know if you're calling it revival, but it's something. We're making room for children. And so when you have to make room, you said, at this point, we either knock out walls or we buy a new house. And so we knew we had to make room. And God incredibly gave us a new house where we went from one bedroom to four. And God supernaturally gave us that house. It was a miracle of God. That we, so we knew that God was in it. And so we had to make room. And financially, we had to shift some things. We had to shift how we spent our money, what we spent it on. It was just a shift because we were making room for revival. I firmly believe that every dollar we need to do these renovations, to change the parking lot, to change sanctuary, I believe every dollar is already in the house. I believe it's already here. I'm not even worried about it. I'm not even fretting about it. I believe God has already going to plan on blessing you. Let me read something to you to encourage you. Acts chapter 4. How many would like to be a part of the blessing that God uses you to bring in the blessing of God? See, sometimes we pray prayers that are full of errors. And we say, well, God, I don't need to be blessed. God, I don't need any more. My needs are supplied, everything I need. It's not for you. You do need to be blessed for the kingdom of God's sake. What if God wants to bless you and increase you significantly? What if God wants to give you an extra 100000 this year or a million dollars this year? What's it for? Why would God want to give that to you? Why would God want to? But many times we think, oh, you know, my kids are out of the house or I've got enough room or whatever it is we think. And we're not thinking the kingdom of God. We're just thinking where our needs are. But I want to show you what happened when a move of God took place in Acts. And we saw the people that got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they said thousands began to come to Christ and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, and go to verse 32. And all the believers reunited. They were all in unity, in one heart and mind. And they felt that whatever, that what they owed was not, the, what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. I claim that God's great blessing is upon us all. And there were no needy people among them. Why not you? Why not you? You know, sometimes we live with such a poverty mentality, we can't even imagine God blessing us. If he did, we wouldn't know what to do with it. God needs to re regenerate our mind. He needs to train our thinking. Prosperity is not a dirty word. I realize there's pastors, there's churches, there's people that have hijacked it. There's bitter people that have left the church that have hijacked it to say prosperity is a bitter word. I don't think prosperity is a bitter word. I think poverty is a bad word. Poverty is not a good word. I don't want to be impoverished. I don't want to have no house. I don't want to have no provision. I don't want to be homeless. Poverty is not the word I want. Prosperity is the word I want. But why do I want it? I don't want it so I can buy more houses. I want to buy it. I want prosperity so I can do more for the kingdom of God. What if God wants you to have more so that you can give more? What if God wants you to have more so you can take in? Maybe God's got a plan to add to your family. You say, well, I've already had children. Maybe God wants you to take somebody in. That's why you have a house with four bedrooms. It's not for you. Maybe God wants you to take somebody in. You're like, I don't know why I got this house with so many bedrooms. Maybe God's got a plan. 
You don't know. You just need to ask the Lord what he wants for you. But God wants you to, we think only ourselves and we miss the revival. We miss what God wants to do because God wants to use you and me. And it says, and great blessings were upon them all because they all had the same mind. They all had the same spirit. And I'm telling you, we must, we must start thinking that God needs to use us financially as well. That prepare, we must make room for revival financially. We must make room in our spirit. What does God want me to do? What does God want me to give? What does God, where does God want me to go? See, for me, it's all about following the presence of God. If God wants me to go somewhere, I'll go there. I, I, I don't care. I'll work as long as he wants me to work, go as far as he wants. I'll live wherever he wants me to live. I'm not looking to move anywhere unless God's looking to move me. But some of us, we get enough money, we get enough of this, and we're like, you know what, maybe I'll retire here. Maybe I'll go there. And some of that is not the mind of God. Some of that is actually the mind of the enemy. And I'll show it to you here in a minute. Because sometimes we are quitting before, we sh before we're done. Because there's an assignment God's got. That's why you're at that job. That's why you're here in Rochester. You've still got an assignment. You don't want to leave before your season's up. Some people abandon their season early, prematurely. And by doing so, they abandon their miracle. They abandon the thing that God wants to do. God wants us to fulfill his perfect will in our lives. Go with me to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. So number three was revival brings prosperity. Not only does it bring prosperity to people, he brings prosperity to communities. I want to just mention that because I didn't say that clearly. When you study the revivals, many times not only were the people blessed, the communities were blessed economically. You see that the communities were turned around with the spirit of revival. The spirit of revival can bless. Rochester could use some blessing. Rochester could use some help from the Holy Ghost. Also, revival brings healings and miracles and deliverance. Number four, revival brings healings, deliverance, and miracles. That is part. I'm not surprised to hear what happened with Cheryl today. I'm not surprised to hear what Linnell. That, to me, should be normal. Not normal in a place like, yeah, no big deal. Normal, I expect God to do it every day. I expect God to heal every day. Why isn't there a healing expectation within us? Revival brings that expectation. Jesus is going to heal today. Jesus is going to set free today. Jesus is going to deliver today. Jesus is going to save souls today. Revival brings souls. There's an expectation that Jesus is going to do it. And if it's not today, he'll do it tomorrow. And if it's not tomorrow, it's the next day. Well, I don't want to be disappointed. I'm never disappointed in the presence of Jesus. If Jesus is here, I'm not disappointed. I know that he's the healer. I know he's the deliverer. But some of us have accepted our sickness or accepted our condition as permanent. The only thing that's supposed to be permanent is victory in Jesus. Victory is supposed to be permanent. Not your sickness, not your poverty, not your struggle. He didn't come so that you could die struggling. Joel chapter 2. Verse 12, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he'll turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, a grain offering and drink offering for the Lord your God. I want to stop there. We must, number five, we must make room in our heart for revival. In our heart. He says, turn to me with all your heart. He says in verse 13, so rend your heart. Tear open your heart. See, what they would do is they'd, rend their, they'd tear their garments when they were in grief or when they were in mourning or they were in repentance or when they were trying to get out, they would tear their garment. He says, I don't need the outward tearing. I need the inward. Amen. I need your heart to be torn open. I need your heart to be available, to be changed. I need your heart to, cha to be able to be turned around. 
where you are open to me putting my spirit in you. Notice what he says. Turn to me, not just with your heart, but how you do it with your heart is through prayer, through fasting, through weeping, through crying out to God. He says, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with prayer, with weeping, with crying out to you. What is it going to take? for my heart to become a little more sensitive. We're living in times where everybody's got a hard heart. We got a nation of hard-hearted people. They're just, they're not only hard-hearted, they're cold-hearted. I'm shocked how many people don't care who lives or dies. They don't care anymore. The only thing, if you disagree with them, they don't care if you live or die. They just want you to agree. If I don't agree with your ideology, if I don't agree with your philosophy, if I don't agree with your politics, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if you die. No longer is there any tolerance anymore. No longer is there any, any spirit of, of kindness. The kindness has gone out the window. Now they're, they're fine if you die, if you disagree. In fact, it was interesting during COVID, some people wished some people would die because they disagreed with them. Well, you know, I hope all those people who believe this die. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? What do you mean you hope we die? Just because I don't agree with you on COVID, just because I don't agree with you being a Democrat or a Republican, just because I don't agree with you because of all that's going on and the stuff that's in our world, you want me to die? What kind of heart do you have? We have such a hard heart and word. Just, just put something controversial up on the Internet, on social media. You'll see all the hard hearts. I hope you die. What? But that's our nation. Our nation is full of death, full of destruction, and people are wishing people dead. That's why the church has to be the place where it doesn't matter how you come in. It doesn't matter what your politics are. It doesn't matter what you believe about medicine or anything else. We are here to love everyone. We are here to love on you. We're here to encourage you. We may not agree... I don't have to agree. In fact, I disagree with some things that you might believe, but I love you. And my heart is sensitive towards you. My heart's tender towards you. But I disagree maybe with this or with that, especially some of the demonic things that are in our world. I disagree with you cutting stuff off of children. I disagree with you cutting off appendages and cutting off things that is going on in children and going, it's okay to think that. I think that's completely demonic but I still love you even if you think that way. I still love you even if you're okay with all the pride stuff coming into schools. And we know God opposes the proud. And so I'm opposed to the proud. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. I'm just telling you the truth. I know some people don't like the truth and disagree with the truth. Don't don't get hard towards me. Let the Holy Spirit touch your heart. Because uh, we shouldn't be hard towards one one another. I've had people on both sides of the aisle leave this church because they didn't think I was strong enough on one side or strong enough on the other. I'm not going to be strong enough for your political opinion. I'll be strong enough for God's opinion. And whatever he says, that's where I'm strong. Am I tender towards people? Absolutely. Do I wish anybody sickness or disease or do I wish anybody uh, um, death? Absolutely not. That's horrible. I want to see revival come in. Who is God going to revive? Those that are dead. I don't need to revive a live person. If you're walking around live in Christ, I don't need to revive you. But if there's death working in you, you need revival. And there's believers, some believers come to church, even though you come to church, your heart is dead. And God wants to give us a new heart, but he says you have to be willing to lay it down. Part of what keeps people from receiving a new heart is you hang on to things. You hang on to unforgiveness, you hang on to hurts, you hang on to pains. And when you hang on to things, it hurts your heart. And it creates a hardness of heart in us. And we say things we shouldn't say, we do things we shouldn't do, And God is calling for a church. God is calling for a people who are willing to rend their hearts, who are willing to lay their hearts down. I'm not saying lay your beliefs down in Christ. I'm not saying to to all of a sudden embrace 
certain beliefs that are ungodly. I'm saying embrace God, embrace his beliefs, but have a tender heart. But more than that, have a tender heart towards God. Because there are things, not people, there are things God hates. And do I hate the things God hates, and do I love the things God loves? And do I have a tender enough heart to know the difference? And he said, I want you to rend your heart with prayer, with fastings, with weeping, with crying out. There's got to be a rending of the heart to see revival take place. This revival is going to cost us something. Go to verse 23. And he says in verse 23 and 24, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, and then the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. Notice what he says. Not only will you get the former rain, you're going to get the latter rain. It's revival, number six. Revival, point six, brings rain. Rain is what is needed on hard hearts. Rain is what's needed on hard minds, on on hardness. It's the rain that breaks up the soil. It's the rain. We try to break it up with words. Words aren't going to break up anything. It's the rain of God's presence. That's why we worship. That's why we press in. When God's presence shows up, he can break down the hardest of hearts. Look what he did with Saul who became Paul. Look what he did with him. Saul, one of the hardest, meanest men in all the... He killed Christians for a living. Yet the reign of God, he he encountered God's reign and God's presence, and it softened his heart. He became one of the greatest apostles that the world ever saw because of the reign that broke his hard heart down. I, I said this so many years. If God can break Saul's heart and turn him to Paul, he can break anybody's heart down. Anybody, even that one person who said God can never reach, God can reach them. And I'm a firm believer that God can reach anybody. But God's revival always brings rain, that fragrance, that presence. I tell you, I smell the rain. I know it's here. I can feel the rain of God's presence. I know it's here. Revival number seven brings new wine, new infillings of the Holy Spirit brings new wine, brings more of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see more and more of the Holy Spirit increase. That's why I talk about the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm not afraid of the Holy Spirit, because that's what he gave in Acts chapter 2. In fact, Peter stood up and said in Acts 2, he said, this is that, which was spoken of in the prophet Joel. He said, this is that. This is the rain that Joel was talking about. This is the rain, and this is the rain that Peter's talking about. I'm going to pour out my spirit, and he's ca- causing new wine, new infillings. There's a hunger. People are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit every single week. Number eight, I see new anointings and, new anointings and callings. I see new anointings and calling. Re- revival brings new anointings, new callings. When you step in to a revival, you step into a revival atmosphere, there's a new anointing and there's a new calling. Some people have been looking and asking God, what do you want me to do? You've been asking God for an anointing. Revival brings new anointings. It brings new callings. There's things God wants to do none of us have seen. You know, I've even been guilty of saying, I've seen it all. I haven't. Nobody's seen it all. Nobody's seen everything God's done. It's not even possible for you to see it all. It would blow you away to see it all. I've seen some, but I haven't seen it all. What God has in store, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. There's things God has in store nobody's even seen. But we begin to see with our spirit eye what God wants to do. And God wants to release new anointings, new callings. Some of you are even going to shift out of your current jobs into new jobs, new careers. Some of you are going to shift even out of the certain gifts that you've worked on in the church. God's going to open up new pathways for ministry, even in the church, even in the field. God's going to open up new people to be able to evangelize the world. You never thought of yourself an evangelist, and God's going to give you a ministry of evangelism. God's going to give you a ministry to reach people, to open doors and set captives free. 
Verse 25 through 27. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. And you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. So I will restore. Revival brings restoration. That's important this morning. Because not only restoration of some things, but notice what he says, the years that the swarming locusts. Here's how it starts. Understand this is a progressing of locusts. The locusts first start with swarming. And then the second thing they do when they're done, the crawling locusts come. And then when they're done, the consuming locusts come. And then where they're done, the chewing locusts come and try to eat you out of house and home. It sounds like it's time for the locusts to go. It sounds like it's time for the squatters to leave. We have to realize God wants to restore things that the enemy has stolen from you, from your home, from your health, from your marriage, from your children, from your grandchildren. God will restore what all the locusts, what all the squatters have stolen from you. God wants to restore. God wants to bring a spirit of restoration. But understand that as we surrender ourselves and we rend our hearts, we open ourselves up to God. He will do the work. I want to share something with you that I saw Monday night in prayer. Because God's been showing me a lot, and as, as I prayed Monday night, people responded, and then the staff, we prayed Tuesday morning, and there was some response there as well. But as I was praying Monday night, and some of you were here, how many were here Monday night prayer? You remember Monday night prayer? I encourage you, if you don't come Monday night prayer, you need to come to Monday night prayer. Because it's amping up. There's things that God is doing. And I promise you, we're going to see more and more. That we already are. We're seeing more and more things that begin Monday nights that affect Sundays. And Monday night, what I saw, and I spoke to it, and some people heard me. I spoke to a spirit of tiredness and weariness. And I began to look out. And it's not that I saw people physically tired or weary. I didn't see anybody sleeping on the pews. That's not what I'm talking about. But I saw spiritually what was going on inside of people's hearts and minds. And I saw it for the body of Christ, and I saw it for many of our people, that you're tired, you're weary. You, you, you've got a spirit in you of quitting, giving up. You feel like it's too much. You don't want to keep going anymore. You've just, you've just felt like it's exhausted. You're exhausted. In fact, you've used those words, I always feel so tired. I feel exhausted. And it's amazing the more we press into God how, some, how exhausted some people get. You were fine 10 minutes ago, but pressing into God, now you're tired. Well, that's a spirit. And as I began to process that, and we began to talk about that as a staff, all of a sudden we realized, wait a sec, that's the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is exhausted. They're, they're tired. They're weary. They're quitting. We've had more school teachers quit. More police officers quit. More people that are doing jobs, they're quitting. They're retiring early. They're resigning. They're giving up. They're moving. They're going to other places. Not because the season is over. They're just too tired. And what's happening is people, some people are abandoning their calling because they're tired. They're abandoning, there's a spirit, Pastor Rob said it in our meeting, there's a spirit of abandonment that's taken in place. And why is that spirit? Because we're not, we're not only seeing it in the, in the world, we're seeing it in the church. People uh, uh, abandoning, people saying, I'm too tired, I'm too busy, I'm too exhausted, I can't work with children. Why is it always children? <laughs> and while you laugh in the natural, I'm going to tell you, it's serious in the spiritual. Why is there such a, an abandonment, people running out the doors for children? 
In our schools, people leaving in droves. In, in our streets, police officers leaving. In the church, people quitting ministries. And children's ministry, it's too hard, I'm too tired. See, this revival is for our children. And we have to understand that the enemy, if you don't realize it by now, the enemy is trying to kill our children. If you don't see what's going on in our school district right now, the stuff they're allowing in our schools is out to kill our children for Christ. They do not want Jesus in their life. And they're going to try to shove, even as young as preschoolers, they're going to try to shove every demonic spirit into their mind that they can get in. Because they know children are more open to receiving things than adults. And they're going after children. They're mutilating their bodies. They are causing these children to make decisions no child should make. Decisions that are ungodly, that are unholy. And there, there's been an abandonment of children by our government. There's been an abandonment of children by our education department. There's been an abandonment of children by families. Not only fathers. We've seen for years fathers have abandoned children. But now mothers are abandoning children. I'm shocked how many mothers are walking. Usually you could count on moms to stick it out. But even mothers are saying it's too hard. And they're walking away from children. And now the church, we can see the church, people are walking away. Ah, children, I, I can't work with children. One of the greatest ministries you should want to be involved with right now is children. Because these kids are being pummeled day after day after day. And God's revival that he's bringing to this house has everything to do with the next generation. Has everything to do with children. Has everything to do with youth. Has everything to do with the next generation. It's always, revival's always about the next generation. It's always about what God wants to do in the next generation. Look what he says right here in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. My men servants, my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. Look what he's saying. I'm getting ready to pour out my spirit upon the next generation. The generation that is here, the generation that is now, he wants to pour out his spirit upon our children, upon our youth, upon them. But there has to be a group, there has to be a remnant that rends their hearts. He says, I'm going to fight for this. I'm going to fight for my children. I'm going to fight for a move of God in this generation. I'm going to fight for the Holy Spirit to come to this generation. Because this is the generation, and I'm starting to hear in Generation Z, and also the little ones, even in Generation Alpha, I'm starting to hear something that's going on in some of them where they don't want what the world's offering. You're going to have to make a decision. Do I want what the world's offering, or do I want what God's offering? And I'm not only talking to the people in the world, I'm talking to the church. There's churches that are caving, that are trying to be relatable, that are caving to demonic spirits that are assigned to take out our children. I can't do it. I cannot cave. I'd rather go down, I'd rather go to jail than cave. I'd rather have you have to take me out because I am not caving to the world wanting to take out our children. And God's been speaking to this church over the last year and a half, and I don't know how many of you have been hearing it, but I want to play a video here in a second and show you what God has been saying over this church, and then we're going to pray as a church. But I want you to see what's being said in this house over the last year, year and a half. Go ahead, Pastor Rob. How many are ready for revival in this place? How many are ready for revival in Rochester? How many are ready for your kids and your daughter-in-laws and your son-in-laws and your husband and your wife and the people in your neighborhood? I mean, how many are ready for something big with God? Know that I, God, would say to you, these are not days to shrink back. These are days to go deeper. These are days to dream beyond what you've ever believed. These are days to see beyond what you've been able to see. For even as Abraham saw those things that yet were not and declared them as they were. Begin to declare 
the things that I've shared with you and be the people of God that I've called you to be and rise up out of the dungeon of your yesterday and rise up out of the oppression and depression of that which has come upon my world and know that I the Lord have set you free and I'm healing you and have healed you for I'm taking you forward for there are yet many people in this city who do not know who I am the word of the Lord to this house Revival is not coming. Revival is here, says the Spirit of the Lord. There's nothing greater coming down the road. The greater is already here. All you got to do is step into the river that's flowing right now. So we know our assignment is to bring the kingdom of heaven into view. That's our assignment. That's what revival looks like where dead things are revived and then it brings the kingdom of God into view. First and foremost, when Pastor Steve came back to his seat, I said, it smells like revival in here. Oh, that's just me. Oh, that's just me. But it smells like revival in here. Yeah, I'm very sensitive to the, the move of God. And I sense that there is a revival. Watch out. Look at somebody say, watch out watch out there's a manifestation on the way there is a full manifestation of God's power on that thing you've been praying for that thing you've been waiting for that thing that you didn't know whether or not God wanted you to have it well according to his will so be it I know we're in Brighton but I've got good news for you in the same way revival broke out in Samaria I'm telling you there's coming there is now here it has already began it's gonna continue to expand revival right here in Brighton and from here from the Jerusalem to the Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth the Lord's about to do a new thing now do not dwell on the past do not think on the former things Behold, I do a new thing now, says the Lord. I am making a way in the wilderness, and I'm causing rivers to flow in wastelands. If God did something great back then, God can do something even greater in this time again. I'm telling you what. I'm telling you what. We need to stand this morning. And we need to lift our voice to God because it's going to be us. It's going to be you. It's going to be us that press in for this. Just because something's declared doesn't mean it's fully manifest yet. And so we not only are declaring revivals here, but we are going to pursue and we are going to hunger after God. I want you just to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, I want you just to pray in the Holy Spirit. Come on, I want you to press in. We're going to begin to pray more and more for a spirit of revival in this place. Father, we cry out for your spirit of revival to move in this place. We cry out, Father, that, Lord, our hearts would be rent before you. Our hearts would be open before you. Lord, that we would come and we'd hunger and thirst for your spirit. We'd hunger and thirst for your presence. We'd hunger and thirst for your glory. We'd hunger and thirst for you, God. Lord, that you would take out of us every spirit of tiredness, every spirit of weakness, every spirit of a quitter. Father, we are pursuing it. Your word has been spoken over this house. And Father, we are going after that today in the name of Jesus. Come on, I want you to pray in the Holy Ghost. I want you to pray in the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, I declare this place is a center of revival. I declare Faith Church is a center of revival. I declare we are a center, a revival center, that you can come, that you can inhabit, that Lord, you can use anything, you can use us, you can use me, you can use this house, you can use this church, you can use our leaders, you can use our people. Lord, we're hungry for your presence. We're thirsty for you. We cry out for more of your spirit. Come on, lift your voice and just cry out. We cry out. We're not tired. 
we cry out. We cry out. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Move in this place. Come on, pray in the Spirit. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, come on right now to the front. And I'll pray with you to receive Christ. Just as everybody's praying. He's saying, I don't even know Jesus. I'm not even served Jesus. I want to be a Christian first. Come on, right to the front right now. We'll pray. You have to let Jesus come into your life, be your Lord and Savior tonight. I declare revival is here. I declare revival is here. I declare it's for this generation. It's for our children. It's for our children's children. It's for the next generation. It's for those young men and those old men. For those young women and those old women. I thank you, Father. Revival is here for the generations to come and move. We cry out for the Spirit of God to move and reign in the name of